huge fan of the demo scene. Um, I'm a bit of a, an odd person. I, I was trained as a computer scientist, an applied mathematician and software engineer, but I am also an artist and I um, did my MFA at RISD. And now I'm actually here at the MIT Media Lab um, as a researcher. So um, my hero, Donna Haraway, wrote that uh, in the Cyborg Manifesto that the relationship between organism and machine has been a border war. And so uh, my artwork investigates this border war, the back and forth between uh, human and computer. So um, I got my first computer, which was a Commodore 64, when I was two years old, and I have uh, been inseparable from computers ever since. Um, so I, 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 I cannot even remember a time in my life when I did not have a computer and I was not using it all the time. Um, so I did, an, I, I did this exercise where I actually painted all of my computers from memory, and so this was my Commodore 64, which I painted from memory. And this was uh, my grade school computer, which was a Dell Dimension Pentium II, also painted from memory. And uh, this seems like a really innocuous exercise, but what, I, it, what it surprised me is like, it's really, these, the way I was painting these paintings really reminded me of something. And I realized that every, all of my memories looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that made me like really start to wonder what um, what interacting with computers so much was doing to my brain. And I actually started to realize that um, I think that the data structures in my brain were mimicking the data structures in the computer. So, actually, when I was um, when I was painting all these things, it wasn't like I could remember like um, a sense of scale and how far things were apart. It was almost like there was my memories were kind of like frames linked together, just you know nodes and links. And so I feel like my plastic brain internalized the computer structure. And so that, that's when I realized I, I am a cyborg and I couldn't really tell where the computer ended and I began. And so like I took into myself the machine's language and the machine structures and uh, the processes and I actually found it to be really, really beautiful. And probably like many of you, after becoming like fluent in the machine's uh, language, I became like really enraptured with programming. Because I could make whatever I wanted from nothing, and it was just the, the best feeling. And I know programmers call it being in the zone, but you know, it all, you could also call it like being in ecstasy. I think. Um, so, um, inspired by John Baldessari singing the instructions of Saul Lewitt, um, I sang uh, my kind of computer instructions. So I sang C++ code on video. And so um, this next program is actually made up of two files: the header file and the body file. Um, I mean, C++ has the header file and the body file, so I made two videos, and then I um, layered them together in a, another C++ program. And like unintentionally, I actually sang this code really spiritually with a lot of emotion. Uh, and you'll, you'll see, let's see, I hope this works. Singing f dot cpp main dot cpp double quote singing f dot h double quote double quote main dot h double quote open paren close paren open curly brace double quote singing f dot h double quote open paren two fifty five comma double quote o f f dot window dot h double quote close paren semicolon Int main, open paren, int i equals zero, close semicolon, i lesson number underscore video, o f f plot window, semicolon, i window plus, close paren, o f setup, open g l, open paren, ampersand, window, comma, string, string, s s hundred, comma, s s less than, less than, double f underscore, window, quote, semicolon, close paren, semicolon, s s less than, less than, i plus one, open paren, new s s less than, less than, double quote, no dot m o v, double quote, semicolon. So this goes on for like 20 minutes, and it took many tries in order for me to do it perfectly. Um, I actually was singing all the code from my, one of my other singing computer pieces, which I'm not going to show this time. But uh, the first one, it, I like, I, it's, it all kind of recycles. <laughs> so I'm actually, um, I, I, in, my, in my pieces, I tend to reveal how I've done everything. So actually, within this piece, I revealed exactly how one of my other pieces worked. And then actually, in the next piece, you'll see that it actually reveals itself as the program runs. Yeah. Um, back to return to full screen. Too far. That was a spoiler. 
Um, so taking this a step further, I wanted to reveal to others how programmers feel about their code. So we use things like, when we talk about our code, we call, um, we use words like elegant and clean, and we talk about having beautiful, elegant solutions, and a good use of white space allows the code to, you know, breathe. Um, so I wrote this other C++ program um, called the Code That Sings Itself, which is a generative sound composition um, where the program line by line maps its own syntax to sound. Um, uh, I'll, let me play it and then I'll explain what it does. So what's actually um, happening is that um, the line length, um, I imagine like the code, because like code is very regular, but it's always, it's not really all the same. I like imagine it being flipped and so like the length of the lines became the melody. And there's two layers of melody. One is determined deterministically and goes through it slowly. And then on over it is a probabilistic layer, um, which is, uh, goes much faster. And then all the white space uh, in the code actually maps to in inhales alternating with exhales. And um, this use of breath, I think, reflects the good use of white space, but also um, that generative uh, compositions are always alive and changing. Um, all the punctuation uh, maps to the tapping, which was actually me just pushing on my desk and the sound traveling into the microphone of the computer. And all the letters and numbers are mapped to keystrokes. Um, and so actually, as you watch this uh, play, you, the whole process is revealed line by line and it takes a full hour for uh, the whole program to run through once. And then it, it will just keep looping and it will always be slightly different. So in, in, the, in these last two pieces, I felt like I was the one in control with the human-machine relationship, but um, in the next piece, I experienced a dynamic shift to where I was no longer the one really in control anymore. Um, and actually, a sad thing happened to me. Um, for a programmer, I actually injured my hands really badly and I couldn't type at all for a, probably a year and a half or two years. And like, I was like completely severed from the computer and I was really frustrated and I was really depressed. And um, I think I spent probably a good hour trying to write up an essay or write some code through drag and dictate and I could not even produce one paragraph. <laughs> um, I actually cried for, for real. I really cried in earnest. And um, I actually used drag and dictate's interpretation of my crying to produce this next, uh, this next piece. Um, and so I used a, a screen reader to read aloud the resulting text and it, result, it, like, it's like, it turned into like this sad and uncanny poem that kind of, um, I think, revealed the computers in my broken relationship at the time. Let's see, full screen. In the event will, will him, 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 and him. And him, and him, and him, and him, and him. Will will will. Will 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 will
and him, and him, and him. System. Will you who are of will and the will and will the. The the end endure it will go a little. I will. Sad time for me. <laughs> but now I can, I can code again, so I think life is good. Um, so um, I'll get back to my slides. I almost can't mouse anywhere safely in this, in this window. Um, so now I'm at MIT, uh, and I guess that, that means this makes sense, uh, not exactly. Um, but um, uh, so like before, I was, all my work was about computer programming, and at, at, but at MIT, I was like finally, um, I learned uh, digital fabrication techniques, and I had the means for what I was doing with the computer to become physical. And so I, I again started applying these like new techniques I learned to um, the old computer games that I was quite obsessed with. So I actually decided I wanted to make this room real. Um, and this is uh, Eye of the Beholder 2, Legend of Dark Moon. Uh, it's a Dungeons and Dragons RPG, I think from 1991. Um, and so uh, I decided I was gonna make this. Um, so I started with, um, I actually had to get the game and retrieve the wall texture from the game. And then this is the texture. And then I used uh, another, I used more computer code to translate it to a 3D object. Um, so pixel values are mapped to the depth uh, and to produce this STL file. And then I mill everything on a CNC, sh uh, on a shop bot, which is a CNC milling machine out of wood. And so I, I milled that object and it took a really long time. Um, there you can see that this was like the very early stages of me making it. And this is the resulting image. This is the resulting object. So this is actually now a 3D object. So after I milled the entire form out of wood, I very carefully hand paint all the pixel values back onto the object, which creates a very, very confusing um, viewing experience because the lights are really high and the darks are very low, and sometimes that makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. It's almost like the lights and uh, shadows have been made physical. And so uh, if you don't believe that this is 3D, this is this one will show you better. <laughs> So I, I have a whole, a whole series of these that I've been working on. Okay, so now I'm, I just was gonna talk a little bit uh, briefly about what my current research is and how it builds off of all the previous work I've done. Um, so my own experiences might be more exaggerated than, may, exaggerated than most people's, but I don't know, maybe not in this room. Um, but we're all cyborgs now, and there's, I, I really think there's like no way to undo this. So we're really ecstatic when technologies give us godlike powers in virtual worlds, but, and we feel really small and frustrated when we are like controlled and oppressed by their rigid interactions. Um, and so in my singing pieces, I use singing to humanize the coding process, but at the same time, I feel like I'm also rehumanizing myself. And so, um, I've been really uh, applying what I've learned about my relationship with computers to my research here at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so for the last uh, few years, I've actually been teaching classes on science fiction. Um, I've, uh, I've taught them at RISD, Brown, and also here at MIT, and I teach it to engineers, artists, and designers. And what I usually do is I have the students read science fiction, and then they have to build things in response to what they've read. Often, this could be a functional prototype. And so I've actually been doing this in my own work. And so what I'm actually building is the, I'm building the empathy box from Philip K. Dix to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Um, and so um, if, you, if you know that, like this is the movie that, this is the book that um, Blade Runner is based on, but in my opinion, all the most interesting technologies that have to do with mental functioning didn't make it into the movie because they're just not shiny enough. And uh, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean. But um, so the empathy box is, uh, let's see, I, I'll have a quote. An empathy box, he said, stammering in his excitement, is the most personal possession you have. It's an extension of your body. It's the way you touch other humans. It's the way you stop being alone. And then uh, later on in the story, uh, someone says, um, I had a hold of the handles of the box today, and it overcame my depression just a little, just a little. I felt everyone else all over the world, all who had fused at the same time. And so Philip K. Dick had described this world where almost everybody left Earth and went somewhere else, but there were a few people left behind because they either couldn't or wouldn't go away, but they were so isolated that they all had this appliance where they would grab the handles, and when they would grab it, they were immediately, like, haptically and empathetically connected with thousands of anonymous people. And to me, that's really interesting because I see a lot of people working with technology now who are just trying to create... Um, they want real-time face-to-face communication to be more realistic, but that's only like one side of the spectrum of what you could do with technologies that connect people. So I, I really like how Philip K. Dick talked about connecting thousands of people, especially like strangers. So I'm actually trying to build this. 
Um, I'll skip that. Uh, uh, and while I was doing this, I actually uncovered a lot of really interesting research about loneliness. And actually, um, perceived loneliness um, is, 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 is as unhealthy as obesity, smoking, and all kinds of horrible things. Um, and it's not, it's not actually how much time you spend with people, it's how you see yourself in your mind, which really makes me think that designing an interface um, which affects the way our minds work could have a lot of impact on something like this. So this is my empathy box, and it actually works. Um, I'm working on building a lot of them because I actually want to deploy them. So what it happens when you, when you use this is you grab the handles and you will, um, uh, if, if one person's grabbing the handles, all the other empathy boxes will start to pulse with light. And then when two people, two or more people are holding them, you all start to feel shared warmth in your palms or your hand. There are actually heaters behind that you put your hands kind of halfway into the box. And then you feel pulses of warmth in your fingers that correspond to the heart rate of the people you're connected to. Um, and so I'm building a lot of these right now. And uh, I'm very excited to see what will happen. Um, and on top of that, I'm like, and also this whole cyborg idea, I, I'm really inspired by this project. This is not mine, but um, this is like a university, I think, in uh, Germany who did this. It's called the Feel Space Belt. It's a belt of 20 motors that um, uh, it'll always tell you where north is using vibrations uh, on your body. And the thing that's really cool is you don't have to be conscious of sense of direction anymore. You just have this unconscious knowing of where north is. Um, and even if you wear it long enough and you take it off for a couple weeks, you still know where north is for a while. And so that's really amazing. So what would it mean to have something like this combined with the empathy box? So you have like this unconscious sense of being connected with all these people you don't know. So that's what I'm also building next. I, have, I don't have a first prototype for that one uh, yet, but it's going to be a necklace also made out of one of those bronze tubes with wood. And uh, you'll feel warmth on your chest. Um, and in order to activate it, you hold the ends like this. And I'm really interested in uh, how that will change the way people perceive themselves. And so like the, the current tra trajectory, which is going to happen in the next few months, is I'm going to like actually give these to people to put in like public spaces, like maybe counseling centers, or people can put them in their living rooms. And I want them to live with it for a little while. I'm going to give people some of the wearable ones to actually like wear in their day-to-day -day life. And then I want to like have all the people meet each other after and throw a dinner party um, and see if they feel like they're more than strangers. And so that's like my short-term experiment, but in the long term, I actually think that um, this idea that came from science fiction and, my, and artwork could really be used as a therapy for depression, anxiety, addiction, and maybe in nursing homes where isolation is a big problem. And uh, I'm very excited to see how that will work. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Um, let's see, I have one closing thing to say, I think. Um, so within my work, I propose that the boundary between human and machine is malleable, suggesting that we can take back our control. I believe we can design technologies that not only avoid making us into machines, but rather allow us to redefine ourselves, to transform ourselves, and perhaps even amplify what makes us human. Thank you. I did notice differences. I actually didn't run it over other code, but as I refactored my own code, I felt the composition change. And it was very strange, actually, sometimes, because sometimes I would get very attached to like a certain like version. <laughs> but that I like didn't really like, but my code, I objected to what I was like poorly written, so I had to refactor it. And then I had to just like let it go and refactor it. And then I like got used to the new version. But it did actually, um, it was really different. It was, it was interesting because as I was running, as I would, it was like a very strange process because I was coding and then I would run it and I, it would produce sound based on whatever the current version of the code was. And as I added features, the composition would change because I was adding features and also because the code was changing. So it was, a, it was an interesting process and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Yes? Just within that, was there any, like, any amount of significant effort in just landing on something that mostly sounded like good, regardless of what it was like interpreting? Or did I, you run into like, 
do while loops just to sound horrible no matter what. You <laughs> I didn't run into that surprisingly because I had this feeling like code. I think code is so pretty. I thought like if I choose a a, a logical mapping, it will be pretty. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because like, I, I, I just felt like code has such, a code already has like this beautiful structure to it. If I just choose something really simple to map it to, it will be good. And it, it, what I did actually do it was really simple. Like I, I recorded my entire vocal range from the lowest note I could sing to the highest. And then I just mapped the line length. I don't ever write lines longer than 80 characters. So it just went from zero to 80, mapped to my vocal range. And then um, I just tried to, and I only, I limited myself to only sounds I could produce with my computer and my microphone, so like there's no external instruments. I use the computer as my instrument, so I like tapped on the computer, or like I pushed on my desk, or I used the keystrokes, and like, or I breathed into the micro microphone, and that was it. I gave myself like a very, very constrained palette, and it, I think it did turn out really well, but I think that's because code is beautiful. And also, like with your current project and some of the, like the, uh, the older project you had, or before, um, like how much of that work is aimed at, like I guess how much of it you're interested in it is in exploring some kind of social um, or like intellectual idea versus actually just playing around with, hey, I'm using a CNC router that's pretty awesome or like just different fabrication things as well. I, you know, that's a pretty new series of work for me, so I haven't concluded exactly what it, I, I know, I, I feel like there's like something hovering at the periphery of my vision about like why I am so drawn to doing that type of work, but I have this, uh, my dream right now with that CNC uh, piece is like, you know how when you're going through one of those games, you're walking down the long hallway that's tiled with those panels floor to ceiling? I want to make that so badly. <laughs> or like a whole room and I could just, you know, sit in it, this milled room or this milled hallway and I just want to sit in it and like, uh, I think maybe once I sit in it for uh, 60 hours, I will, I, I'll have an answer for you. <laughs> yes? So I see a common thread in, thread in your work of working with agency, different kinds of agency, whether they're having it or not having it. And I find myself wondering, could there be a relationship between that, that's the only one way that I can't connect it to as well as the room. Could there be a relationship between that and the room? Hmm. The extension of the virtual world where you can do things to it in the real world? That could be part of my appeal because like, I, I, I remember feeling so empowered when I was younger in this virtual space and maybe I don't feel that anymore in my real world and I have this urge to extend uh, that world into the physical one so I can you know, maybe rekindle that feeling. Um, and actually running a CNC makes me feel really powerful. I really uh, I feel awesome. <laughs> So that could be that could be part of it, I think. But um, yeah, I'm very interested in a, like the idea of agency and interface designs because I think like most interface designers don't give um, their users much agency. Like I, I actually read um, some very popular user interface design texts that like all designers read, and they have design principles that are that say things like most users would rather be successful than knowledgeable, and like this is actually something that's starred and bold that they're trying to. Uh, encourage people to do, and I think that's horrible and scary. <laughs> and I think, uh, I, I think that there, there needs to be a drastic shift in like, how we design technology such that people, we're not just um, controlling people. Because like, if you think about neuroplasticity and the way we're like, establishing pathways in our brain by like, repeating interactions through these, this, these particular interactions in software over and over and over again every day, like, so um, it, ter it terrifies me, actually. <laughs> And so I, I want the people designing the software to think more like science fiction authors and like think about what happens when, when those tiny decisions scale up really big and um, how you can not, uh, not create worlds that are um, scary dystopias. That was a bit, uh, I rambled on a bit there. <laughs> So what's your, what, do you have a research plan for the Empathy Box project yet, like for how you're going to deploy them? Or? Um, well, I'd like to, um, there's this, I would like to put some in some public spaces, like there's one building, I'm at, I went to RISD before and there's this counseling building where they have light box therapy and meditation and all these things and I want to put it there um, for the art students because uh, I kind of feel like they're going to be like curious and want to touch it. Uh, I also want to just like let people, I want to give it to people to take home. Like to me, that's really interesting. Like just the fact like this, I, I really want to know where they decide to put it in their house. 
Like, is it, is it something that goes in their bedroom? Is it something they put in their living room? Is it on their desk? Like, how do they, like, what kind of appliance does this, does this become? Because actually, when I was thinking about it, I was like thinking about it, like, I want it to look like, an, like a science fiction toaster. Uh, I really, or a microwave. I really wanted to evoke this, like, appliance-like feel. So I want to actually see how people incorporate it into their life. Um, I'm mostly limited by time and money on how many I could build, or else I would build 100 and actually connect them all, because, like, they do function. Um, and then uh, I would like to, if I could, I would give it to people for a year. Um, but maybe in the, in the short term, I'm only doing about five of each. And then we'll see what happens after that. If you put them in a public space like that, what kind of instructions would you put? That's interesting. I actually have been thinking about that a lot. And I don't know, I kind of wonder if, I, if it wouldn't be best to like include like a little parable or something. You know, um, something that's a story, not like a not like formal instructions. And I think I have to think about, I have to write a, like a little, I, I, I have to like, I, I don't know, write a, like, like a little fable that goes with it uh, and let people experience it that way. I could. And then, and then add your own story above oh, that's a good, that's a good idea. I might do that. <laughs> Returning to your remark of when you couldn't program, I saw someone demonstrate a system he created which actually was functional. And the way to find it is Python conference, PyCon 212. And if you go through the list of users, you'll find it and it's open source and free. So you actually can program in Python using that. Oh, that's nice. I could have used that. <laughs> and they do your drive. I'll look that up. Thank you. Thank you so much.